Greetings, everybody, and welcome to this, the 21st episode of the ABT Time Podcast, the podcast that proves that the world doesn't ever have to be boring. And if it's podcast time, it means it's three o'clock in the afternoon in California and eight in the morning in Melbourne, Australia. Jen, are you there to join us? Dr. Jen Martin. I sure am. Hey, it's our 21st birthday, Randy. Where's the cake? Where are the balloons? Where's the champagne? It's our birthday. Like we're, we're aging rapidly. <laughs> yeah, um, I agree. <laughs> and we're going to age more rapidly today because joining us are going to be our two unclenchable colleagues, which uh, together we are a team known as the Unclenchables. This is our second gathering of the Unclenchables, and this is our new <laughs> artwork. Um, let's have uh, Unclenchables assemble. Rod and Jade, uh, all coming to us from now from Sydney and Canberra and Melbourne, Australia. <laughs> yeah, the three Australians. I'm and, a little embarrassed, Randy. You didn't <laughs> tell me it was a birthday party. I didn't bring you anything. Oh, uh, well, Jen's clearly the birthday girl <laughs> with the best, or so I mean, sorry, Jade is the birthday girl with the best photo ever there in our artwork. Uh, in fact, let's have a but I can't. Here. There we go. Rod, I can't believe you didn't send me presents to, to Melbourne. I'm concerned. I didn't know. Randy might be a communication professional, but he's not good at it. So I didn't know. We are a communications team and we've got a special guest that's going to join us for just a few minutes in, in a moment. Um, and just to introduce who the three of us are. So Jen is the co-host, head of science communication at the University of Melbourne. Uh, Rod is at Australian National University in Canberra, where he is the something or other in the something or other institute. What what are the specifics there? You are the... I totally am. <laughs> Deputy director? The... Yeah, for, for now. Uh, Deputy Director of the Australian National Centre for the Public Awareness of the Sciences. There you go. And then we have Jade, newly arrived back in Australia and just about to get out of quarantine, head back to Melbourne. And she is from Reagency Communications Corporation. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and what, what else these days? You got another credential for us, Jade? Yeah, well, a CEO of Reagency, normally based in New York, but currently a guest of the Sydney police in hotel quarantine. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Excellent. All right. So before we get into all of our stuff, um, we got our special guest, our recurring guest, Mog, who, Mog, are you still 17 years old? I turned 18 now. So. Oh. oh. <laughs> <laughs> I am an adult now, now yeah. Official. Um, okay. So there's your introduction for who the team is, Mog, and um yeah, you want to give us just a quick little update on you're about to head off to NYU and you're going to be staying in cinema there and tell us what's going on. Yeah, so I'm already at NYU. Um, I'm actually in my dorm right now uh, and I'm studying basically science filmmaking. I get to make my own major. Um, so that's that's really fun. Um, yeah, so I guess that's a quick intro to who I am. Thank you for having me. This is great. You betcha. Well, you, we're going to keep having you back as our ongoing project. Um, and also, you know, just to warn you on Friday, you and I are going to have a little chat and I'm going to hit you with some major ABT stuff, whether you like it or not. Oh, I'm part, excited. I'm very excited. <laughs> part of the project. Um, and then let's see you. Um, you've got that video that you sent. And yes. that is, tell us what's that, what's that in a contest for? Yeah. So it's in the Breakthrough Junior Challenge. Um, it is a pretty large, like I would say, go say like film festival. It's uh, basically a challenge for 18 and under um, to make a, a video on a complex science topic in under three minutes. So uh, my video is now top 30 overall. The winner gets about $400,000 um, and it, the prize gets presented in a big, huge like uh, event in California. So I'm really excited to hopefully win that. Um, and now we are in the popular vote stage. So the top 30 videos got posted on their Facebook, on the Breakthrough uh, Foundation's Facebook. And the most amount of likes or the each video in each region with the most amount of likes moves on to the next round. Um, so basically awesome. <laughs> I need to get as many likes as possible on that on my video. All right, we're gonna give you the unclenchable bump, we hope. So uh, we'll do what we can for <laughs> you. And I'll send everybody the video when we're done. And then we'll, in the next couple of days or so, we'll do what we can. And who knows what that translates into anything, but uh, you know, every bit helps, right? <laughs> yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. You betcha. Um, and anything else important? Otherwise, we'll let you get on with where you said you had to take off. Yeah, I have a class in about five minutes, so I'm going to have to run there. Uh, <laughs> but I mean, there are a few things, but I'll, I'm sure we can get to that on Friday. Yeah, definitely. All right. Well, you and I will dive in deep on the ABT and lots of other stuff. And uh, OK, I will check back with you. And thanks for checking in with us. Um, yeah, thank you so much. And uh, Jade, oh, well, thank you so much. That is. Oh, sorry. She directed message me, but. I would love to keep contact with that. Um, but 
thank you so much. You betcha. And now he's got to go off and wonder what in the world was this intro of the Unclenchables. Um, <laughs> we'll explain yep. that to you as well down the line. So, okay, cool. See you, Mog. Talk to you on Friday. Bye. Bye. Okay. So, and just before we get going here, and we're going to jump in really quickly, but for anybody who's new listening to this bizarre group, um, here's the origin of our group name which is uh, my good friend Rod here a couple months ago had me on his podcast. I was dreading doing the appearance. I thought he and his buddy Will Grant, the two hosts, were going to just ridicule and make fun of me. And when I finally showed up there, he had done an incredible thing, which was he dug deep in my past and found these reviews for my movie Sizzle from 2008. And Sizzle was a crazy film that I made that I paid for out of my pocket. We gambled a lot on the whole thing. Turned out wonderful. It was really funny and fun. Had a very diverse crew, um, the lead actors, two of them were black, two of them were gay. It premiered at the Outfest Gay and Lesbian Film Festival, played at a bunch of other festivals, lots of college screenings. Everything was wonderful and joyous until the science bloggers got a hold of it. And then they vented their spleen on this movie and all the way up to it getting a rotten review in that great bastion of film criticism, Nature uh, magazine where they took it on themselves to have one person write a rotten review of the movie. Uh, it's the beginning of some of the worst you know, experiences I've run into with the, the science community. But um, he, he began our discussion by reading this. He dug up this one review from a great guy, Thomas Hayden, um, who was a writer, science writer for US News and World Report and a buddy of mine from way back when, totally got the movie and thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, and this is the first paragraph. Let me just read it here as we get started. Um, quote, I need a tighter ass, tighter ass, the cameraman says. He and his crew are in a Senate office building in Washington, D.C., setting up to record an interview. The cameraman is trying to get the lighting right, but the sound man standing in for the interviewer, Randy Olson, is too laid back to make a, make a convincing scientist until he clenches, that is. And in a perfect profession, professorial voice in tones, my name is Dr. Olson. The goofy scene epitomizes the central question of the movie, why can't scientists learn to chill out? That really ought to be the subtitle of this podcast. Um, and that is the origin of our little word, the unclenchables, because I'd long since forgotten this wonderful review. And when Rod dug it up and read that, that we used that word for the rest of that whole podcast. We kept referring everything to being clenchable and unclenchable. And as a result, we now have this wonderful group here, the four of us, uh, who had to have a nickname. And all three are Australians. And that's a throwback in my memories to my years in the 1980s I spent in Australia. Nowadays, every time I hear an Australian accent, it gives me all kinds of wonderful flashbacks. So that is the origin of our little group here. And I want to introduce a little segment here that's going to light the fires and get us going. And we're not here to have a picnic and I'll be sweet and nicey nice all the time, even though we all hopefully like each other. Um, but I'm going to pick up on something that we got into a month ago when we did the first round of this group. And two of you may get a little bit irked with my bringing this up, but I wanna dive into it because we're here to talk about communication. So there is this term in that cropped up in the US a little over you know, a year and a half ago with the Black Lives Matter movement uh, of defund the police. And it was presented all, at lots of rallies and painted on streets and things like that. And re represented really the far left um, last November, there were a number of um, Democratic candidates who lost in the election down ballot. And for the pundits, they immediately got on TV within days and began blaming part of those losses on this slogan saying, defund the police. They chose the wrong term, you know, just didn't play right with the public and offended people and resulted in these people losing their positions. None of that was based on any data research, anything like that. It was all these gut instincts of all these instant experts on TV thinking that they know communication. Well, let me show you now a little clip here. This is from Spike Lee um, in the past week, released a three-part documentary on HBO. And I just filmed this little bit with my video camera, my iPhone off the TV screen. So the audio is a little low. You may have to lean forward to hear it totally. Um, and you'll see it shaky cam, but it's, um, it's about a minute long and it sort of speaks for itself. And then we will dive in and talk about the relevance too. Well, and then I want to connect it with the, the, what we discussed a month ago. So Let's see. Oh, God, I hope I checked the right buttons. Matt, tell me if we got any technical problems, but here we go. My name is Congresswoman Cori Bush, and I represent Missouri's first district. Words do matter, mm -hmm. but people have been talking about reallocating funds as it relates to our police department, diversifying and all of that for years. How far have we gotten? When we said defund the police, the world woke up. 
And now it's a mainstream conversation and we're getting places that we weren't able to get before. So yes, words matter, but if it takes, the thing is when they, when the words started happening, we need to reallocate funds. It didn't happen the way it needed to then. And so when people come against us saying, oh, you all are messing it up because of the way you're saying it, the way you said it didn't provide results because we got death after death after death after that. And so now when we change the words and we make people talk about it, then they want to say the problem is well, how we're talking about it. That's not the problem. The problem is you should have fixed the problem before we got here for me to put my mouth on it. There you go. <laughs> you explain to me. I understand that. It broke it down. <laughs> I love my people. Got to get it close. I know you do. Okay, so that's the clip. And now here's the relevance, which is that uh, uh, about a month ago, working with Dr. Michael Osterholm that I've been working with for almost a year now, since last October, when he first started criticizing the failure to communicate and the whole climate issue or COVID issue, uh, we had this discussion about there was this incident that happened about probably two months ago. Um, and really, it's from a year and a half ago. So Fauci, in the beginning, had this video in which he said, there's no reason to be walking around with a mask. And that is still out there. And it's on Facebook. And as Facebook was taking things down, people on the right said, why don't you take down that Fauci video? And the answer is right there. It says Fauci's marks were made in March 8th, 2020, and do not re represent his current stance on face coverings, nor the updated guidance issued by CDC. So this is what we talked about last time when we got into it. And I had, and uh, Ostrom was talking about this and I said, you know, that's basically a piece of corrected science. As soon as I said that term, he lit up. He said, I like that term, I'm gonna start using it. He's been using it ever since. Now, the two of you, I'm not gonna say which two, but two of you uh, disagreed with me on this term when I brought it up a month ago, but you're not the only one. So I'm not attacking you because another good buddy of mine who's a senior scientist at the National Institute of Health, he's a member of the National uh, Academy of Engineers, and another buddy of mine, longtime collaborator, scientist, who was a major producer of a lot of my film projects, and two or three other people, all scientists, all had the same thing, which is, yeah, we need a term, but that's not the right term, because that makes it sound like science is something broken, and it's just going to present the wrong image. Well, Osterholm and I disagree, and when I heard that clip from Spike Lee's film there the other day, I thought this is the same thing, which is, they came up with this term, defund the police, and all the pundits came in. So that's just not the right term. You know, you're going to have all these bad things. And what did she say there? As soon as we started talking that way, things started to happen. She said the way you said it didn't provide results. And it's a matter of picking one term like that. And even if it's not perfect, just getting everybody unified around it and, pre and, and preferably it's something provocative like that. And then last thing to say on this term of corrected science is that there is a reason for that to be the term. This is an article in science, a, an essay in 2015, with Bruce Alberts, former head of National Academy of Science, Ralph Cicerone, also former head, Marsha McNutt, I think maybe is the head now or was. Anyhow, all these big cheeses coming together and one of countless essays about science being a self-correcting profession. The question is why hasn't the science world ever had enough communication savvy to solidify that into a single term and a concept and get it out there because your average person on the street wouldn't even begin to know that this is how science is perceived at. That's what's missing. That's why Osterholm jumped on it saying, this is what we need to be educating people about is this is how science works. And the spokesperson like Jen Psaki for Biden there, when that came up uh, and the right wing guys were accusing her of Fauci's clip, she should have had a term to be able to say that's corrected science. That yes, you know that's what it was a year and a half ago, but it's been corrected and now that's what it is. This is how science works. And if you just solidify behind it, and stick to your guns for a while, you can plow these paths in communication. But if you sit there with focus groups from day one, you never get anywhere. And that's, again, what that woman was talking about there. So that's my little opening salvo. Anybody got any thoughts on that stuff? Yeah. Yeah, get stuck. I'm going to kick off with, thanks for saying my podcast name, which you didn't. It's called The Wholesome Show. The Wholesome Show. Show. <laughs> Sorry about that. It's only about, I don't know, one and a half times better than this, but this is very young. <laughs> The battle lines are now being drawn among the, but, this is where the unclenchables blow to pieces. <laughs> but, but to be fair, I have to say, um, and I don't like saying this, you, you, you'll understand how horrible this is for me, Randy, but I see your point. Um, normally, I just like to argue with Randy because often people don't, and I think he deserves an Australian to <laughs> kick him in the groin a few times. I know Jade helps particularly, but um, yeah, I take the point that the, the, the purpose is cut through, and that's the first time I've heard it expressed that way. 
So even if it's a bit of a, uh, it's not perfect, I agree, it shouldn't be focus grouped. My discomfort with it was because people would go, well, corrective means it's broken, et cetera. But you're right, the other terms or the other things I've heard, which are none, don't appear to get cut through. So if this can establish cut through, even if it is for people to start flinging their own shit at it, that's, um, that's a start. It gets the conversation open. So I'm, I'm less concerned than I was with that little argument about the defund the police, because I also thought that. I thought saying defund the police, that's not what you really mean. That you know, was what, what was interesting in the way that Spike Lee introduced that was he seemed to first bring it up by saying there's this term and, you know, it's caused problems. And actually, the way he brought it up was he said that it's been weaponized by the right defund the police. Mm. But, you know, regardless of that, stick to your guns, pick one single simple yeah. message and start fighting it. And the thing you've heard me say before was when the iPad came out with that name, all the pundits came out and said, that sounds like a feminine hygiene product. And that is the worst name ever for a product. And they're going to be changing within a few weeks or months. It's 10 years later. Nobody remembers that squabble. It was huge squabble that happened right at the very beginning. As soon as they did their first presentation, everybody said, you're idiots. Pick the wrong name. 10 years later, all gone to the past. These well, things. Just what called it the Apple tablet. The Apple tablet does not roll off the tongue. That's it. Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. These, these are branding battles in which sometimes you just have to have a kind of a gut instinct. Um, and, you know, interesting because we're going to get in this, into this in two weeks. Here's a little preview of coming attraction. In two weeks, I'm going to have these two buddies of mine, Julie Carmen and um, Jose Sant uh, Angel Santana. And Jay, did you ever meet Julie Carmen here? In, in, you met her for I don't believe I did. I didn't have oh, the pleasure. Okay. She's, she's really awesome. She's a uh, triple threat actress, actress, um, licensed family marriage therapist and yoga instructor and really an acclaimed actress over the, the ages. She was one of the lead actors for a movie called The Milagro Beanfield War long ago. Um, and then Jose is also a veteran actor. He, he Among many films, he was in Desperately Seeking Susan in the 80s. Um, great, great guy. The two of them did the same Meisner acting training back in the, the 70s and 80s. And about two months ago, we went to lunch and the two of them just caught fire talking. And for two hours, I just sat there, couldn't get a word in edgewise, but they're so cool and so interesting. So I'm going to have them as guests in a couple of weeks. And I want to try and work on a little bit more diversity in our, our guests. You know, we've been mostly white folks here and that's, that's okay for a while, but it's time to diversify a bit. So they'll be great. But in having them on yesterday, or I think this morning in the New York Times, there's a whole article about the Latino community, Latino, 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 not one word in that article about Latinx. And you're hearing this now as they've come up with a new name for themselves, Latinx, which means includes everything. But like you say, it doesn't roll off the tongue. Latino is beautiful and has worked for ages. Do you really need to mess up things with Latin X? Isn't, uh, it, and isn't I, it pronounced Latinx? That's Latinx that's, every time somebody addresses it in the media, they make yeah. a joke about that. Yeah, I think it's Latinx or I don't know. That sounds way cooler, though, to me. I honestly thought at first it was Latinx. And I thought, <laughs> oh, that sounds pretty cool. Latinx. Yeah. <laughs> if they're calling it Latinx, me. I, I don't even know. But what I know is the New York Times is not using it yet. And so based on that, I will be bringing that up with them and hearing their opinions. And, you know, all this stuff. There was a segment before that woman started where they were all talking about words do matter in, in these movements. And that's where. All of this feedback, Randy, it comes down to one thing. Don't be such a scientist. Because we want to say um, Latinx is the correct term Um reallocate funds to the police is the correct term whereas defund the police is not the correct term yeah. if we're such a scientist that we insist on the accuracy then we're going to have so many caveats that our message doesn't have actual cut through but by you know not being such a scientist and finding terms that actually relate you know resonate with the public then your message gets cut through if not no one hears your message so it doesn't really matter how accurate it is does it Absolutely. And I don't know how, you know, and well, then here's what a scientist will say. Well, then, all right. So then how do we know when a message quantitatively is good enough to go with, you know, I, you got, that's where you got to have intuition. You got to have an ear for it. You got to have, at least have some experts that you trust. And our experts tell us this thing has a good tone to it or something like that. Ah, it's but Randy, I kind of feel the same as Rod does. Like, I, you know, if you want to have an argument, I'm always happy to argue with you because it's been fun. <laughs> but but I, I don't have a big problem with corrected science. And I didn't last time we spoke about it either. It's just that I think Rod and I both had an initial gut reaction of knowing exactly what the Murdoch press in Australia would do with a term like that, because it would, it would not lend itself to our cause the way the press here works. But, you know, if that's the only term we've got, and if that's a term that people understand what it means, and they're going to start using it, then I'm 
all for it. I don't need to argue with you, but the, the press yeah. here has a very particular way of mangling yeah, yeah, yeah. ideas but like that. This, this is where <laughs> the science world suffers from an absence of leadership, which is that if you had leaders, they would get together and just take on Murdoch and say, here's the yeah. battle line. You know, We don't care what you say about self-corrected science or, or corrected science. We're telling you, we're the experts. This is our field. We're defining this term for the rest of the time. Now we're all going to get behind it but you don't see that happening. Instead, what you see happening is what's happened with this pandemic in the United States, which has been 25 experts on every different channel on CNN and MSNBC, all in different directions until eventually a month ago, we talked about the, you know, that editorial in the New York Times saying the CDC needs to stop confusing people. It's been so bad. And there has been such an absence of examination of this and pointing to it. They just, Mike, again, Osterholm has gone from being semi-respected to me to now having my absolute total allegiance because at this point now, almost a year later, he's the only guy who's gone on TV and said, we're not communicating with a singular voice. That's very important. All the rest of them is we need more money to work on more vaccines and we get the vaccines. And what's wrong with those people that they won't follow what we tell them to do? They're not hearing a clear, single, powerful voice like that. Ah, Jiminy's. But this this yeah. pandemic has hit at least in countries like yours and mine and, and similar ones at a time when gross suspicion of anything that looks like authority, elitism, et cetera, is at a at potentially a pinnacle, at least a pinnacle for the last many, many decades. So it was, a, it was a perfect storm of that too. So the idea of a leadership in science is immediately suspicious to people, including those within sciences, maybe mostly those within sciences, because we all know we're the most important field and the most important people with the most important things to see. So how the hell could that fuck with lead me when I know more than them and I'm more important. I mean, that's a common, I'm paraphrasing, but you know, so I can, <laughs> the ground is not right for that. By the know, way, the uh, after our last <laughs> gathering, Mike Strauss had a, a word for you. It turns out he's your number one fan. And he said, just, just ask him to be a little more blunt with his comments. <laughs> I'm, crap. I'm feeling it's early in the morning. I've only had one coffee. I'm feeling shy. You know how it is. Well, <laughs> you know, We've only got so much time to consume on this topic, but you know, there's a whole nother dimension that Jen and I have had a little side discussion on already, but it's the tall poppy syndrome for your country. And that, that adds into what you were talking about there, Jen, which, and it adds yeah, what massively. Right yeah, which is that your average person on the street as an Australian just doesn't want leadership for the most part and is ready to chop down the tall poppy. So that adds into it as well. Um, but anyhow, the science world at some point has got to quit their whining and actually get active and realize that the way you get active is you, you unify together into a singular agreed upon cutting edge. This is the stuff that Michael Crichton said 22 years ago in his AAAS speech. It's all right there. The blueprint was handed to them and they said, nah, not, that's not the way to do it. Um, until then, they're just going to continue to be kicked around, beaten around. And the sad thing is that they're not doing any self-examination about failed communication. They seem to only be pointing to the right and saying those people are evil. And that doesn't heal anything or, or improve. Uh, no, I that's group therapy where you all get together and point to the things you mutually don't like. That's group therapy. That's not a communication strategy that's going to get you anywhere. It's very yeah. true. And, and, you know, furthermore, two weeks ago on Meet the Press, they had uh, forgotten which politician on there, but they, were, they, they asked one of their experts, you know, is there any place where this in, in trying to get the vaccine uh, and mass mandates implemented where it's actually worked? And the guy said, yeah, the military. The military has just said everybody's going to do this or you're out and they're all doing it <laughs> so they have huge vaccination rates so i hate to say it but that is how the system ought to work needs to work has to work but um i'd also that say um jacinta ardern in new zealand was one of the first leaders in the world to say sorry everyone i know it sucks we're going into hard lockdown until we've got no covid and everyone yeah. at that was so bold at the time no other country had done a similar thing and she got so much criticism, but then New Zealand ended up having one of the lowest COVID rates in the world. So by having, she's not a scientist, but she had to listen to the science, made it a strong statement, a bold statement, and then never backed down. So everyone in New Zealand kind of knew where they stood. Whereas at the moment- yeah, and, they've, and they've squashed it again, right? I mean, they've well, done okay, exactly right, the same. So, so on, one case and they went into lockdown and they've never yeah, yeah. moved it again. Okay, so on that note, without going off in three hours of discussion, because we could easily on this topic, let's take a vote from each of the three of you on simple, um, this moment in time right now for your country, should your country stay the course and keep doing what you've done for the lockdowns or is it time to develop a new strategy? Uh, just A or B. Um, As someone a in hotel quarantine, I think we shouldn't just stay the course, but double down on the course. 
Because oh, at the moment, go. I know in Victoria, we're okay. saying, oh, you know, we're just going to extend the lockdown another week, another week. If they would just say, look, sorry, guys, we're going to be in lockdown until the end of November. I know it sucks, but on December 1st, it, whoever's vaccinated is vaccinated. Good luck to you. We're going to open the borders. And everyone would go, oh, I can do that. I could stay in lockdown for that long. But at the moment, it just feels like we're not really sure where we're headed. There's no end in sight. We don't really trust our leaders to give us the right directions. We can't make plans. Yeah, so yeah. I think we should just okay, be like, well, you're, you're, this you're, is what we're doing. And you're starting to dig into that core principle of narrative, which is certainty. And mass audiences want complete certainty. So that's that's interesting as well. Rod, um, stay the course or time for a total reboot? My vote is, it's like my life motto, do it hard and fast and then get out. Same <laughs> thing. So, same as Jade, only slightly shorter. Yeah, stay the course, only harder. Yeah. Okay. And Jen, <laughs> uh, stay the course or time for a reboot? 100%. There is no point right now. It, it makes a mockery of everything we went through last year to just say, oh, fuck, it's too hard now. Let's stop bothering. We absolutely stay the course, go harder, get over the fact that our Prime Minister screwed up beyond anyone's belief, our vaccine rollout, get everyone vaccinated, and then we can come out. But if we come out now, it's, uh, yeah. yeah, I'm 100% okay. with Jade and Rod. Okay, excellent. All right. So on that note, I had a whole bunch of other provocative things to dive into. But instead of doing that, <laughs> let's bring on our special guest today. This is very cool. Um, and I'll cue him in a minute to join us. And let's hope the tech all works on that because you're going to have to take off in a bit, Jen, because uh, I know you got a lecture to do. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it dawned on me the other day, somebody last week said, so who's your audience for the, your podcast? And I said, I don't know. <laughs> me. That's it. That, I'm, my, I'm the audience. I listen to these things. Me and my on. friends, says Randy. That's it. Not even my friends, just me, you know, and I, I drive up to Oxnard to surf. It's an hour each way. And I listen to a podcast and I don't like any of their podcasts, but I love re-listening to these things. I mean, these are all my favorite people <laughs> that are having on here. And so today's special guest also is in that same group of favorite people. Um, years ago, when I was a postdoctoral fellow at the Australian Institute of Marine Science, they that place was this big building monstrosity in Townsville, which is amazing. You know, your government very wisely single-mindedly, single narrative, went out there and built one huge, well-funded facility to study the hell out of this reef, did it systematically. And I was hoping Jeremy Jackson would go into more detail on it last week, but it's really admirable how you took this systematic approach to your, your reef. And in this gigantic facility and all the bizarre places outside of Townsville, where you have to drive these commuter cars 45 minutes to get out there. Um, but there, when I was there, there were probably 200 people working there. And it was in this big building that um, had like, I think three floors upstairs, and those were all brightly lit with artwork on the walls and blue carpets and all this sort of stuff. And then there was this machine shop down below in the basement, basically. And the work that I did there, I mean, it was a dream come true. They gave me tons of funding and to build all this complicated equipment for culturing larvae out in the ocean. And so I set to work with the machinists down there and instantly hit, hit it off with them. They were my favorite guys. They were great storytellers. So not a coincidence. I spent a lot of time down there. The head guy, George McNaughton, was this Scotsman who's just got the wildest, funniest sense of humor ever. And then John Small is our guest. And he became part of my, not only making my equipment, but I took him out on some of our cruises on ships. I think I even brought him up to Lizard Island. We're going to dig into that. And then he years later came over and visited me in Hollywood and we've stayed good buddies over the years. And uh, John, are you going to be able to join us with the tech? Yeah, mate. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can we see you? No, if I go in, if I go negative, in Randy. No video on this. No video on this. Oh, shucks. Um, okay. can, can you just we give us 10 seconds of video where we can just see your smiling face and then we'll go back to just audio? Uh, no, oh, no. Uh, that not, exiting not that 100%. No, okay, no. all right, totally, totally beat them. <laughs> Dang it, too bad. All right, um, shucks. Uh, Randy, could you back off, there, yes. back off on the swearing? Randy, back off on the swearing. I've okay. heard shucks and dang it. I'm very worried about you. Like, yeah, it's a lot of profanity. <laughs> Ducks, dang, I'm just out of control here. Okay, in that case, uh, Jono, uh, give us a little bit of background. How did you happen to stumble into a job at the Australian Institute of Marine Science? Well, Pretty simple. I'd played in the squash team and one of the members of the team was a scientist. I didn't know that. Um, you might remember him, Peter Moran. Of course. There was an ad in the local, local paper. I showed him my um, write-up, what I wanted. He said, no, totally wrong, mate. That's all heavy engineering stuff. This is fine, delicate work. I said, right on. So I just changed my story. And he looked at me and said, yep, I'll take it down to George Mack, see what he thinks of it. And that's it. <laughs> and uh how many other jobs had you had with scientists 
previous to that? Oh, never. I was in um, heavy engineering. I, I worked underground in the mines, like in Australia and overseas in Erian Gia, Gia, like doing um, heavy um, diesel fitting and machining work. So, but nothing. It was an absolute eye opener when I went out there at times. So there you were taking orders from schmucks like me coming down there saying, can you build this and that for me? And then we take it out in the field and break it and bring it back. And your thing broke. Can you fix it? Um, what, tell me first off, what, what are your best memories of the scientists that you interacted with there? Well, it's a bit like, um, it's a bit like I work in the mines. Like you've had people from all over the world and, and the scientists came from all over the world to come out there. Like, as you know, uh, Israel, the U.S., Italy, France, and 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 really, uh, we've, I've met a lot of crazy people in the mines, and the scientists are pretty much the same. They're they're out there, um, but wonderful in, in that um, what that explained to us what they were trying to do. Like everything was a big secret when they're doing a project, but they'd come down and they'd have to speak freely to us about what they're trying to do, and and that was great. No, good on great with um, the majority of scientists. Um. And like on, on a day-to-day basis, day-to-day basis, how much did you talk to them? Were they down there all the time or just mostly left you alone? Oh, all the time. No, that, that'd come down. Like just come down. Often um, if they get fed up but for a change of environment, they'd come down just for a chat and see what we're up to. I don't know whether I was trying to check out whose secret project we're working on, but no, we had, we had a lot of interaction with the scientists. Um, all right. Now I have a question I, for John. Yeah, yeah, go how for much- it, Jake. How much did everyone laugh at Randy's name in Australia? <laughs> oh, yeah, well, we, yeah we, we, we took the piss out of it once, uh, once we got used to it. Randy was a good scientist in that um, um, he'd, he'd come down, he'd crack a joke, and um, he'd sort of speak at a level where he could get it. Um, we'll talk later on uh, about the, um, the outrageous workshop parties, but <laughs> uh, that's probably where Randy got some of these uh, ideas that oh these guys that, that yeah these guys are different yeah they were George George was a wonderful leader. Uh, tell us a few things about George. Well, he's um, the old Dallas Scott. Um, my wife's Irish, and so we've got a little bit of an insight into the mentality. Um, very hard nut to crack. Um, outrageous accent. He. He got the job. He used to work in um, CSIRO tobacco research in Mariba. And um, John Bunt was working on mangroves. So he wanted some sort of instruments to be able to study the mangrove leaf. And George was working on leaf tobacco. So it seemed a natural fit. He rode down a, a black Russian Cossack motorbike down to do an interview with John Bunt. And he stayed the night and, and the bike burst into flames while they were having dinner. <laughs> so why only George could be riding around on a Russian motorbike? <laughs> um, how many years you worked there at Ames? Uh, Twenty years, Randy. God, you know, is that long? Yeah, and, yeah. I know you came out on on at least one cruise. Did you come up to Lizard? I did yes. You remember the old um, the war we had between the houses and uh, <laughs> devised um, the the uh, the swing shots to fire. Water, water cannonballs over at the opposing house. <laughs> I do indeed. So yeah, so I was there. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we had some. So Lizard Island, we used to take a whole group of about you know seven or eight people up there, and then I brought John along on one of those cruises because we had the um, all that equipment to be repaired and had to have the technical hands there. Uh, now, all right, so you know, I, I'm hate to push you on this, but I'm going to offer up something that is the darker side of what I saw there in Australia. And I had so much fun, you know, I love Australia and the whole culture and everything like that. But that said, um, the last talk I ever gave in Australia was at the Coral Reefs Symposium that they held in Townsville, 1988. And it was the last, I came back separate for that. I'd already started at University of New Hampshire as a professor. And I gave this farewell talk and it was about all the work that I'd done there over the, the previous three or four years. And I, the room was packed, probably about 250 people lining the walls and all the people from Ames were there. And in the course of that talk, I showed all that equipment that you helped build. And then I talked about it, you know, and I want to thank this person for making that thing, and this person, this, blah, 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 all these different technicians who played a part in the whole deal. And that night at the dinner, this one technician came up to me and, you know, do you remember the guy? He was, was he from Bangladesh or from Pakistan? 
and I think he maybe worked in Barnes lab and he came up with tears in his eyes and he said, no one ever thanks us here. Never, never, never. No one ever says publicly any thanks for the technicians. We're the hired help. We're treated like shit. And we're just, you know, assumed to be part of the thing. And for me, uh, zero thought went into the idea of thanking all of you guys, blah, blah, blah. But it was that moment of seeing the class structure that exists there. And I'm sure descended and derived from the British, but that doesn't go on to that extent in the US. So there's so many wonderful things I can say about Australia, but that hit me really hard that night of that guy thanking me for something that I thought was just natural. So any thoughts on that, Jono? Uh, actually, you've hit on something very important to me. You invited me to go to that coral reef symposium in 88. Now I sat down beside, he wasn't even a scientist. I, I won't mention names, but the scientists off side, you know, you get your first thing. And they really, some of them got their head up their bum. And uh, he looked at me and he says, what are you doing here? You're getting, above, get, getting a bit above yourself, aren't you? And I thought, I could have thumped him. I really could have. But anyway, I sat there and I thought, oh, well, Randy, you had invited me to go. And then you made mention from the, from the stage, you know, and like to thank such and such and such and such. And in particular, you know, Johnny Slingshot Small, I just turned to the sky and his eyes popped open and I just looked and smiled benignly. <laughs> but yes, thank you very much for that. And you did do that. Um, as I said, you're a guy you could talk to and, um, and, and really inviting um, the technicians out on your trip. That's, not often done. Um, well, I've been so, yeah, waiting. Thanks, thank I've been waiting 33 years for those thanks. So thank you for finally getting in touch to thank me for that. Yeah, no, no, seriously, that, that I, I had no idea. You know, I hadn't read the rule book or it just it really blew me away when that that whole thing happened like that. Um, did you have other instances like that in the workshop uh, did, ever being talked down to like the hired help? Oh, they, they got over themselves pretty quick because um, we would just be too busy or, oh, mate, don't know, we can do it. And then other guys like yourself are getting all this great work being done and they're wondering, how are they getting such good cooperation from these guys down there? And then they would see what we've produced. So, um, yeah, we, we had them by the... And by the balls, basically. <laughs> yeah, no, I, maybe that's what I knew from the outset. Now, here's another little anecdote that actually is the reverse dimension uh, and is very cool about Australia. Uh, when I first showed up at Lizard Island in 1981 as a graduate student, and uh, uh, the workshop there, they had a you know workshop with all the basic equipment. And about two or three days after I got there, there was a graduate student from Macquarie University, I think, that, that showed up, just a typical you know you know mid 20s Australian guy, and. Um, he walks in the, work, the workshop and he looks over and goes, ah, TIG welder. Oh, yeah. And I go, what, what the hell is that? And every one of those graduate students walked in that workshop and spotted the aluminum TIG welder. Uh, they, you know, you guys are brought up still with this connection with actual real world experiences, things like that. American kids are all brought up in the suburbs. They don't know the first damn thing about how to live out on a ranch or anything like that, you know, unless they're from Texas or whatever. But it just blew me away that every single person there knew what an aluminum welder was, knew all those basic sorts of things. That was just like the one little specific detail, but you saw it over and over again of that sort of connection with that more rural and rugged sort of, of lifestyle. The, the three of you have any comments on that? And do you see that difference in cultures? I learned what a TIG welder was in New York. So I don't, I might, <laughs> not quite sure if. I think, yeah, there's definitely a, a, a lower divide between the city kids and the suburban kids. We have a travel culture. We're ex exposed to ideas. But yeah. I also completely agree with that, that in Australia, we often have the poor poppy syndrome. So I remember as a young kid being asked by a teacher, do you think you can do this, um, you know, scholastic competition that's a year above you? And I said, yeah, I think I can do that. And she said, well, you've got a bit of a big head, don't you? And I was like eight years old or nine years old. So in Australia, we're very much about like, oh, don't go above your level because we're all equal here. So no one can be too high. But and that's good. And then it also has its bad sides as well. Yeah. So I agree with yeah. you both. I, I never had that problem because uh, I actually do have a big head, so there, everyone expected it. <laughs> but um, I, I was brought up in in Canberra, the nation's capital, and um, I was always brought up. My parents didn't go to uni, but there was no question that that was open to me and whatever was open to me. But 
They also sent me to a snobby private school from which I duly got expelled. But before that point, <laughs> Hang on, hang on, hang on. Stop. What did you get expelled for, Rod? You can't say that without telling us. Yeah. Um, Commerce. So anyway. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, gee, there's a bit of, we're trying to be a bit of an enigmatic presence this morning, are we, Rod? Commerce. I just saw an opportunity and, you know, like like all good entrepreneurs, I took the opportunity. (laughs) Businessman. (laughs) And that that didn't go well. Well, it did go well because I got booted out of that posh school. And at that posh school, the idea that you wouldn't all go to university was not even considered. As soon as I got to a normal but still high achieving public school, there was everyone there. So I got dumped into a a class of, um, it was car maintenance. And I thought, don't you just pay people to fix cars? But all the kids around me, they, they, they were 15 and they'd hold up a thing. And they'd say, what's that? And I'm like, I don't know, metal. And they'd say, oh, it's a carburetor off of blah, 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 blah. And I thought, holy shit, these guys know all this stuff. That's that's amazing. But until that point, it had never crossed my mind because one paid people to do that. I, I quickly was disavowed of that from about 15 years on. It was like, ah, it takes more than that. And now when I pay a plumber 80 gajillion dollars a year to clean my drains, I think, man, I went into the wrong profession. So it, it was kind of a hybrid for me. Uh, and Jen, you got any thoughts on that uh, class distinction element? Oh, look, I just totally agree with Jade. I think the tall poppy syndrome is so alive and well here that it plays a really big role in how you're brought up in Australia. You know, on the one hand, it's this sense of wanting to um, believe in yourself. And, you know, we, we especially as a woman, right? You know, as a woman, as a girl, you know, you can achieve anything and, and whatever, but, but don't tell us about it. Don't stand up. <laughs> don't stand up and, and tell the world that you're actually going to achieve anything or, or big note yourself because that's pretty much the worst thing that you can do. So it's, you know, kind of mixed messaging, I reckon. <laughs> and, and probably for all these things, we can just go look at the plus and minuses because then you come to the US and we've got the hero syndrome here where everybody's told they're a hero and next thing you know, they're utterly brain opposite direction so oh well um let's see and we're not gonna have too much time because jen's gonna have to take off in a bit but um i want to get on to um john we had a couple other little things but tell us your your little issue is that with um well i won't even say any names but you've got an old old mate there who is uh bought into the anti-vax mentality tell tell us your vaccine experiences (laughs) yeah look i just don't get it like i know you're, you're doing this communication thing and um there's so many different people with different, um, totally different ideas about it. Like that old mate is a is a conspiracy theorist, and this is a this vaccination thing is a trap by the <coughs> global elite to um, kill off half the population. Like you've got someone with a scientific degree coming out with nonsense like that. If the one of the, the general public are confused, you know, like um, to my mind, as, as I said, you Marie, with Marie had a, a medical condition five or six years ago and they have all these people give advice about uh, what sort of quackery to to do to go with it i was just convinced you know like i'd seen the science for 20 years how it works and how it was cross-checked and double-checked and triple-checked i just had no doubt in the science um maybe foolishly maybe not but um for a scientist to come out with some of the nonsense that uh, you guys would have seen all of this um this stuff about the anti-vaxxers and that I, I just don't get it how someone schooled in science can have that thought pattern. I don't get that. Well, you know, my older brother and his wife live in Missoula, Montana, and uh, they went and, and saw this uh, specialist uh, for, I think, uh, spine issues uh, a month or so ago. And they were in the lobby and they said, um, is the guy vaccinated? And the nurse said, you'll have to ask him. And they go in there and he's not wearing a mask. And they said, are you vaccinated? And he said, no. And uh, if you want to leave, you're welcome to leave. And they sat and chatted. And, and this guy was like the only show in town, the best expert. So they hung in there, did the whole consultation with the guy. And he turned out to be the best doctor they'd ever been to. And then the whole drive home, he said, they just scratched their heads. How can a guy this smart not want to be vaccinated? It just defies logic. That's all you can say over and over again, these instances of defying logic that literally is what it is. Um, they're not. They're not applying their science brain to the issue of vaccination. Would be my my shorthand for that. Like you can be very good and very rational in certain things, and it's very easy to com- compartmentalize aspects of your life. And a lot of people are holding this up as an entirely different thing. That the science or the the myths about whether it works or not are, are a, they're a cover for other beliefs and deep seated you know suspicions of other other matters. So that that's not a solution, but that's a description. So we we hold conflicting beliefs in our heads all the time, even as normal functioning human beings. 
it's it's not uncommon it's just unfortunate it has to be on something that's a little bit you know um planetarily critical yeah john john where are you living you live in atherton where do you live nowadays no i'm um, i'm still in towns already right actually um you lived up up on the hill there on the old pink palace i'm just down the down the road from that guy in the nightclubs uh, amazing oh, yeah, oh, nice, gonna... nice part of town not, not that i attend them not that i did <laughs> <laughs> uh they still have the casino out there on the out in the jetty yeah yeah they've, they've done that up though recently it's really nice they're going to um, go ahead with it um, you mm. have the casino then they fly up fly the guests up to orpheus island where they've done another resort thing and then the cattle station so it's all tied in it's going very well and what about the old uh, coral reef wonderland? Is that still? Existing? They just ripped. They just ripped the um, section of that down, and I think they're redoing it like a multi-million dollar refurb. But that's in the process of being torn apart as we speak. Wow. Um, and, and tell us a few more. You and I traded a couple of notes there. Um, your your best and worst moments there in the workshop in twenty years at Ames. Well. The, I'll go through um, the worst one first, then we'll finish on a happy bit. The worst part was when they changed the whole structure of how it ran. Like, it was very free. As I said, George's philosophy on on leadership was, there go my men, I must follow them. And I, I'd never had that before because I always worked in a very regimented environment. And it worked wonderfully. And then they changed it over to a very uh, structured thing of who you could see, what you could do, and it just didn't work. But coming up... Uh, an example of the madness that went on, like we would have, um, these to be all the modules, like corals, fish, mangroves, whatever. And as a scientist, they have a bit of a party. So we thought, well, we could throw a party. We'll throw one at Christmas. And, and then we'd have these outrageous skits. Um, and now, wait, wait a second. Hang having... on, hang on. Let, let, let me underscore this. This is probably the hardest I've ever laughed for one solid hour in my entire life. And <laughs> the Christmas party in 1986, I had no forewarning as I went down there for what the hell was going on. Everybody was already drunk. Uh, I mean, that's the major difference between <laughs> United States laboratory institutions and ships. They don't allow alcohol on ships at all in the U.S. Every cruise we went out on Ames began by loading pallets of beer into the ship. Um, and that Christmas party, you guys had worked all year long making these individualized gifts for individual scientists that all had backstories. That's what was, I wish I could have filmed that one that year. And let me just try and think of a couple of them because the director that year was this guy who was a very pious and studious man who always wore, you know, coat and tie and was a workaholic. Um, and the guy had worked himself to death and one night um, in exhaustion, drove home, fell asleep at the wheel and drove off the road into the brush and hit a, <laughs> into a tree or something. And so just as one sample of the many gifts that they had worked on all year long was they, they made this crown for him because he was like the king of the whole place. He was the director of the whole institute. And the crown had a chin strap, leather chin strap on it, never forget it. And then it had a bar that came down with a ball on the end of it. And it was for him to wear when he was driving late at night. So as he started to fall asleep, he would honk the horn when he leaned forward with this bar on the crown. <laughs> and that guy, and that was like one of 20 different uh, prizes there. And then the, the other one I remember distinctly that probably is too graphic to tell about, but basically one scientist as the chief scientist had been on a cruise on the big ship, um, had been in the middle of it, having sex in the captain's <laughs> captain's cabin. Somebody came bursting in and it turned into a shouting match or whatever. And so these guys had made this little device that was like a slider thing that would hang on the chief scientist's door at the ship. And on one side, it had the stick figure, a couple having sex. And on the other side, they're not having sex. And you could slide it back and forth. It said the chief scientist is in or the chief scientist is not in. Um, and then the climax of that entire insane party after all those gifts was they had this big picture of the director hanging on the wall, made up to look like the Pope. And That's right. right down there, like a hundred people <laughs> packed in there, all drunk and screaming and howling. And then George is the, the MC and he says, and now everybody turn to the Pope. And if you shout at him, you, he might give us a sign. And so a hundred drunken people are shouting, give us a sign, give us a sign at this great big black and white picture. And all of a sudden these two little red trickles, <laughs> tears come out of the eyes on this picture going down. 
And I learned later that behind the scenes back there was my friend John here pumping a syringe with red fluid in it. Is that right, Jono? <laughs> True, I have to say, it's all true. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, uh, the tragic bit was I hit the syringe too hard and the director's um, PA, uh, Jean Tyler, lovely lady, uh, passed away now, had this beautiful white frock on. She got covered in this red dye. <laughs> oh, <and> on. <laughs> oh, my God. But we had I'm the, not sure if that's the, a, a story of Australia or just a story of the 80s. Uh, it, it's you, that's a good point. It's a little of each. Um, but all I know was that I went and did a postdoc for two years at an, an American institution. There was never one party that could hold a candle, and the cruises were non alcoholic and everything. God, you Australians, you know how to enjoy life so well. That's why I enjoyed the 80s in Australia so much. That's why it's fun doing this thing with you guys and your Australian accents and all your stories. Oh, my God. Every time I came back to a U.S. lab and I have to sit there and look around, oh, man, Put, send me back to Australia. Um, and so what was the very best memory, Jono? Oh, look, to be honest with you, um, the one that still sticks in my, in my mind was being invited to that Coral Reef Symposium by your good self, so like um, nice. just as an actual thing. Um, you know, good on, good on you for that. Good on you for your attitude. <laughs> I was a little bit out of control by then anyhow so <laughs> things were changing in my life and I was kind of losing some of my respect for institutions to begin with so maybe that was I have, a, I have a question for John do you think that um, of all the scientists that you saw that you said you get a mixed bunch coming to do work with you there do you think that the Australians are some of the more relaxed ones or do you think that scientists are scientists from no matter where they're from Scientists are scientists, can no matter where they're from. Like, um, good answer. There was, there were, like, there was one. I'll give you a, a story that sort of goes against the Australian relaxed thing. There was a guy that turned up there, and he, uh, an Australian chap, and um, I've got a bit old, his name almost slipped out. I can't do that. He brought his wine collection out to Ames and put it in one of the the, the rooms because there was air conditioning. So. Um, well, in the typical Australian fashion, whenever we had a party, we'd go up into his wine cellar and drink his wine. <laughs> <laughs> but, he, but he was one with his head up his bum. And, he was, and just people are people all over the world. Like, um, I was fortunate to meet so many and, um, and get to work with them and talk to them and socialise and have some great fun. You know, six of one, half a dozen half with any group. Uh, yeah, you're, you're kind of breaking up now. So maybe that's a sign that we're at the end of this episode. Um, so Jono, thank you so much for joining us. Might have you back on again, especially if we could find some way to talk George into joining us as well. That guy is... Yeah, so I'll, I'll work on that. I'll work on that. I'll He's one of the funniest you. humans I've ever met in my life. Oh, oh God. he is a natural storyteller. Yeah, truly, truly. Yeah, yeah. We, we got to find a way to have him on. Uh, tell him I'm so sorry about the health issues that he's going through with right now. Um, yep, yep. And yeah, I traded a couple emails with him, but uh, great to hear your voice. Great to talk with you. And uh, we'll let you go on that note and then wrap things up here with uh, Rod and Jade. And you guys got any uh, final thoughts for the upcoming week or so? You know, I'm going to try and lobby both of you to see if you can join me next week again um, with our guest, John Sturman, who I spent an hour and a half talking to today, who's a tremendous professor at MIT and has this climate interactive uh, simulation that he's developed and, and does now at the COP meetings. And it's, it's a huge, huge thing. And I am such a fan of his um, for two reasons. Number one, he's the guy in 2008 who had the our article in science where he took the, the executive summary from the, um, the IPCC reports and had, the, you've heard me tell that story, Jade, right? Yeah. 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 No, yeah. He had two undergraduate students at MIT and he just said, let's see if these graduate students can understand the science that is supposedly in such simple terms, the executive summary, everybody can understand it. And 84% of them got it wrong reading what the, the IPCC had put out. And it's such a good note. And you know what I always say was that should have been held up as here's our problem. Let's get to work on it. And then by 2015, there was another thing about these things that just become unreadable. And then today I had an hour and a half chat with him and he said, it's just gotten worse. You know, it just keeps on going. And it's the obfuscation thing. There's just no discipline. There's nobody pushing anything back into structure. They're just letting everybody do whatever you want. And the more, the better. And so he gets all of that. 
So number one, I was drawn to him through his communication instincts. And then in 2013, or no, sorry, 2010, um, I was hosted for, a, we did a, a screening of Sizzle there for Earth Day. And while I was there, he was doing his climate interactive. So I did the whole thing. And it's a whole day long thing with about 40 people in the room. And it was tremendous. And I just sat there like, why, why can't there be some mass public media attention to this thing? It's so good. And yet there hasn't been. It's still kind of an academic exercise that he now does with large groups with the UN and with the State Department and at the COP meetings and on and on and on. So he does it with the best of the best, but it's still the heavily educated crowd that he's doing it with. And if only it could be crossed over into a broader form that needs to be a simpler form. And that's why if you guys can join me next week, because by the end of our discussion, um, he ran through a ton of stuff and I got lost in the weeds and he was running the model for me and I'll send you the link. You can do it. And then I finally just uh, tell me the ABT on this. And then suddenly, you know, he, he was having a hard time trying to figure out. We started trying to work on the ABT. We're going to trade some emails this next week and see if we can start the whole thing. But it needs that broad, simple um, approach and communication. And, you know, and what's the best resource for a broad, simple approach? It's, it's guys like John Small. You know, you can see he's a great storyteller. He's got common sense. He could be in, a, in a, one of our working circles from our ABT framework course right now. I'm going to see if I'm talking into joining the course. You know, that's what we need is a mix of people like that have just got good I think you, you, Randy, and you, Rod, have given me the two best questions to ask any clients or any pe person that thinks that they're good at communication, which is what's your ABT and then to whom do you want to communicate and why do you want to communicate them? What do you want them to, what are you trying to get out to them? Most people can't answer those two questions. So there's some fundamental steps where we can make a lot of progress if we can only answer those questions. Yeah, absolutely. And most people ought to be able to answer those questions like bang, bang, you know, it's this and this. And yeah. when you get this them moves into something here, this, I mean, I've been reading a lot of seditious texts about universities in many countries lately, because I'm feeling bolshy. And what strikes me is also these people are being inculcated from, from very early in their careers in increasing amounts of corporate speak, weasel words, bending your research and your attitudes to suit funders rather than finding funding for research that matters. And so now mm -hmm. I think the casualty, the, the, um, the climate change report, God, I've suddenly forgot what it was called. The international IPCC. 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 Yeah, IPCC. Right. So that stuff, I think, not only is it, it, it it's scientists being sort of caught up in their own asses, mixed with an increase in corporate speak, weasel word, strategic planning, long direction, five year goal, blah, 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 which means there is no cut through because that's not its point. You, mm. Everything's being warped to suit, you know, like the professional politicians accounting bottom lines and that sort of thing. And that's becoming stronger and stronger and it's insidious. So well, you know, it, it. It, it's interesting. Um, I wish Jen didn't have to take off a few minutes ago because she had a mm -hmm. lecture to do. But if she were here, um, two weeks ago, I had my buddy Joe Newman as the guest um, talking about his work in, in child behavior. And the subtitle of his book is Compassionate Discipline. And mm -hmm. Jen connected with that. She's got two kids. And she said, I love that subtitle, Compassionate Discipline. And that's really what we do with our story circles and our working circles training is the same thing. You need that discipline. You need compassionate discipline. You need people butting in there with saying, stop right now and tell me the ABT of what you're rambling through here. Yeah. And, you know, people don't want to do that. And it's a lot of social dynamics that result in these people just going on and on and on and on. It's really hard cutting people off. It's really, well, it'd be really hard. I, I don't want you to feel bad about yourself. It's like, I, I, I don't care. And you can cut off in a good or a bad way. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I know. And, and what can well, you, you do? Can, you can say shut up fuck face with a big smile on your face. You can do words, that. I, I think you can also um, entrain people and condition them into being open to being cut off. And yeah. if you establish an atmosphere where nobody cuts anybody off and finally somebody does it, then, ah. but if you like, that's what we have in the working circles is they've already been trained in the course. Basically, here's the important questions to be asking. And if somebody is interrupting to ask a question, they're helping you. That's a good thing. You're getting a good question. It's a cultural thing to some extent. And if you set the air like, well, we don't ever cut people off, then you just, yeah, people go on and on and on. Yeah, you're asking for trouble. You're asking for long meetings in which the process is the product. That's right. And then you end up with people like Jeff, Jeff Bezos, who bans PowerPoint, thinking that PowerPoint is the source of the problem when no, the like structure is. Yeah. The it's, problem is the hammer, not what we do with it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It goes on and on. Well, Short -term I guess we all agree on everything here. And sadly, the one point of disagreement <laughs> I thought I had with the two of you, both of you caved in and said, all right, we'll go with you. <laughs> That's, what's your fault for being persuasive? I thought you would be, I didn't think you'd be that good at it. 
<laughs> yeah, that was great. Um, all right, then. That's enough for this week. Thank you so much, both of you, for joining us. And are those your snowboards back there I'm looking at in the, the corner? My favorite one is that one. That's the Japanese handcrafted snow surfer bamboo be- delicious deep powder board. Those yeah. are more everyday boards. That's American, so who cares? But this one, <laughs> ah. it's, it's a delicious board, and I, there's no point in having it in Australia. I can only is use Is that it. one inside of a, a travel bag, or is that it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, neoprene, okay. deli- yeah, custom. I love it. Why we need yeah. COVID to be over so that Rod yeah. can go back to snowboarding in Japan? If it weren't illegal, I'd marry that board. <laughs> <laughs> he sleeps out every night. It's, it's just so nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, all right. <laughs> On that note, the unclenchables shall disassemble. Um, keep in touch. Answer my emails, Jade. And um, think about <laughs> it. I'll send you the link, both of you, for John Sermon's model. It's, it's really fascinating. We're going to have a really good discussion next week. So I hope you guys can join sure, us. Sure. Yeah, you I can good. play if you want. Just, just remind me. Okay, that's that's great. Let's do it. Cool. All right. Have a fun yeah. week. Talk to you later. Bye-bye. Bye. See you guys.